woe to the city of oppressors, rebellious and defiled. She obeys no one. She accepts no correction. She does not trust in the Lord. She does not draw near to her God. Her officials are roaring lions. Her rulers are evening wolves who leave nothing for the morning. Her prophets are arrogant. They are treacherous men. Her priests profane the sanctuary and do violence to the law. The Lord within her is righteous. He does no wrong. Morning by morning, he dispenses his justice. And every new day, he does not fade. Yet, the unrighteous know no shame. Let us pray. Almighty Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time, this morning that we, we can come to your house, Father, to worship you, to praise you, and our risen Savior, Jesus the Christ, in the Holy Spirit, Father. We ask that that Spirit would flow through us, Lord, as an outreach to this world, but right now, Father, that it would flow through us during this service. That you would be praised, Lord, in all that we do. And we thank you for our risen Savior, Jesus the Christ. In his name and for his sake we pray. Amen. Good morning. I want to welcome those watching on the internet, those listening on the CD. Pastor Donnie is, I talked to him yesterday, he's got a cough. Uh, but he's not feeling poorly or anything. He just he just probably can't get his breath too well to to speak in. So he called and asked if uh, well actually Sharon called and asked if I would take worship and and Kathy friend will be bringing the message for us. So we want to uh, to just remember Donnie in prayer today. Uh, I see Mom Jane isn't here either. We want to remember her in prayer as well. But if we have no announcements. Do we have announcements? Okay. If no announcements, then our opening hymn is Pass Me Not, and that would be page 346. Sister Julie, please rise. <laughs>
have concerns and praises we want to bring before the Lord at this time. Brother Butler. surgery Thursday and uh, cancer in the uterus and uh, she just asked for prayer for Jim Michelle's very up to that and prayer they sent everything away for biopsy in hopes that it's not in any other organs but uh, young girl young married couple Mother Faith Andrew it's on the plane he was 
was preaching there in Morocco, an imam says, uh, we don't want you to preach anymore. So the imam went to the mosque and was telling all the Muslims there, uh, be, be aware of the <coughs> preaching of Jesus that's going on around here. <coughs> don't pay any attention to us. And this is what the preachers are talking about. And so he proceeded to tell them all about Jesus and the Bible and salvation. And people in the crowd, the Muslims were saying, well, this is what we've been missing. This is what we need. And people were being converted right then and there in the mosque because of the imam <laughs> preaching. I know. And it reminded me of Paul's when he says in Philippians um, chapter 1, uh, some preach out of contention. You know, and some preach preach well, some preach, you know, against the Lord and um, where there's God so great. Amen to that. You cannot get away from God. Yeah. Just one way or the other. Well, amen, and that's Morocco too, so that's interesting to Pat and I. Yeah. <laughs> as, as we had at one time asked for God to use us. I don't know a better way than showing a, a Muslim Christ. So, so that's and they're working. The mission, missionaries are working. Right. Praise the Lord. Any others? Unspoken praises, concerns. Father, we bow our hearts before you, Lord, with concerns. Many, many concerns, Father. I'm not going to go through them all, Lord, but that, that paper that I wrote them on is here. It's on your altar. The word that were spoken for these concerns are in this building right now. They're in our ears, Lord. They're in our mind. Let them be in our hearts too, Lord. As we lift these people up in prayer, concerns for friends of the family, concerns for sons and daughters, concerns for our children, our grandchildren, our parents. And Lord, these are things we need to have in our daily prayers as well. One I do want to point out because I know it's hard. Is the Bischoff family, Lord, I ask that you would just strengthen them. Just reach down and touch them. Wrap them in your arms. Fill them with love, Lord, and comfort. And if possible, understanding. 
For some of these things are so hard to understand, Father. Cancer is hard to understand. Sickness is hard to understand. But we know, Lord, that when we we bow and we put these things before you, and Father, if they're happening to us, we truly give them to you, then we grow. Sister Ann spoke of a missionary. How wonderful. Your word reaches every crevice of this dark earth, every slum. every battlefield. Lord, that was in a mosque, and I'm sure it's beautiful. So even in the most beautiful places, your word reaches. And truly, Father, the most beautiful place to be is in your word. Whether it's in this book in front of me or in our hearts or in our prayers, It's all about Christ, Father. This world is worthless without him. We are nothing but dirt. And that's how we behave sometimes, like dirt, like filth. But Christ is the Redeemer. He grabs us by our hearts and pulls us up out of that muck and mire. And if all these these people who've been laid at your feet, they but give whatever ails them the problems to you, I'm not saying they're going to survive. My brother Brian and I were talking before, before service, and he said, we're all dying. And we are. Some of us will die sooner than others, but it doesn't matter. What matters is where do you go? What's going to happen to your eternal soul? Because it is eternal. And you have told us. You have to make a choice. You don't force it on us, but you you put it everywhere. It's in the stars. It's in the trees. It's in my brothers and sisters. It's in, it's in the world. It's Christ. And I pray that scales fall off of this nation's eyes because we are truly, truly being led down a path that we really don't want to go. So, Father, what? I guess what I'm, I'm trying to say is We need to focus on you. Just keep our eyes on you, no matter what happens around us, because it's going to get ugly. It already is starting. So, Father, we we are just so thankful for our risen Savior, Jesus the Christ, that he, he died for us on that cross and he spilled his blood. So my blood wouldn't have to be spilled. He came for me, and if I was the only one like that, he'd come for me. But he also comes for everyone. He wants no one to perish. It's just hard for us to see that through all the glitter and the din of voices out there that speak all the time who need to just shut up. We just need to hear Christ's voice. For he stands at the door and knocks. So Lord, I again put all these people before you. There's cancer here. There's travels here. There's pain. Pain here, Lord. So we lift them up to you. And we thank you. That we can do that. That you are a loving God. In Jesus' name. 
In this holy name, in precious name, we pray. Amen. Brian had an authorial thought, but I've had one I've been wanting to say for about, I don't know, six months. I think I, I better say it. But his is based on Jerry Clower, so I'm sure it'll be fairly funny. But maybe next week. I was just, I watched a show, it's been a, been a while, I watched it on YouTube, and it was Dr. Phil, but they had, I don't know, I'm not politically correct, they had some guy who wants to be a woman, and and his partner, I really, I really don't even want to talk about it behind here this way, but, and they're both guys, and I, I don't know, but they had some other guy who was talking about, what are, you, what are you doing? What are you trying to do? And he was pointing out things to them like, a woman is a woman. A man is a man. You can't mix the two like that. I, I, I really wish I could, could remember it because it was really quite good. But the point then that I thought was, well, how many genders do we have nowadays? So I looked. There are over 75 genders. I'm just like, no. No, I'm sorry. I, there's non-binary, non-female, non-male, non-electric non toaster, non-whatever you want to be, you can be now. It all depends on how you identify. And it goes a little deeper than that because that's what Satan will do. He'll twist you up in that somehow. He'll get you twisted into things. And you can research this and this and Whatever. You just go right ahead. There are two genders. God makes it really simple. Two genders. I also heard, a, and by the way, those are male and female. That's it. Pretty simple. Pretty simple. But there is, I, I heard a famous celebrity speak one time and she said don't get me testifying there are there are many ways to God there are thousands of ways to God right then I turned it off there's one way to God everything's kind of simple with God two genders one way to him now for each of us it's different how we get to Christ so there are millions of ways to Christ because we're all different we have to see him in our time when we decide that I'm through with this. This is ridiculous stuff over here that I'm listening to. Oscars, Grammys, whatever. It's stupid. It's frivolous. There's only one thing that matters, and that's hearing that knock on the door. And that's Christ. Nothing else. And if you believe there's anything else in this world that matters, think again because it's only him. And it doesn't matter if you give $500 today or 200 If you give 200 cents, give it with a right heart and a faith in Christ, and God will multiply that. So if our young ushers would come forward, I would appreciate that.
this I gotta get by the mic because I don't have my mic down but it's on page 596 leaning on the everlasting arm please rise Julie start with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you once again this morning and we, we've welcomed you into this place, Lord Jesus, and I thank you for, for who you are. I thank you for your printed word that lets us see straight through to you, Lord, and through the power of prayer. Lord, I'm grateful for this opportunity. I'm grateful for how sharpened and refined you make me every time you ask me to do your will, and I've said yes, Lord. I just thank you for that in advance. I ask you now to bring together these notes, Lord, um, your word, the thoughts that you've given me. Just bring them together in a concrete way so that we may see your will and we may do your will and that others will see that in us. And we ask all this in your precious and holy name. Amen. 
Before I go to scripture, I want to tell you just a, a small bit of background about how this message came to be, and it wasn't very long ago, yesterday afternoon, as a matter of fact, and throughout the night. So um, look past the dark circles and hear the message that God has, has given me to provide this morning. Um, on our trip home yesterday from Trinity's tournament, she was in Ohio for a volleyball tournament, and um, Brian was listening to a radio broadcast, and there's a lot of things Brian and I can't agree on, and radio is one of them, but I dutifully listened because he was driving, and it, it motivates him. It keeps him awake to listen to these documentaries, and on the other hand, I'm falling asleep because I'm not as interested, but um, as God would have it, Pastor Donnie called on our trip and said, would you be willing to deliver the message tomorrow morning? Or no, first he said, will you be back in time for the service? And then he said, would you deliver the message? And I thought, oh my goodness, yes, I will. Um, God willing, I will. And so that was the end of that phone conversation. And we just happened to be listening to a documentary. And I'm not going to speak about global warming. warming. I have no, no education in that whatsoever. But the documentary was talking about global warming and the effects that this man believes it has or will have on the state of Florida. And this message came about from the last few words that he used when he concluded his message about global warming. And he said, here's how he concluded his presentation. He said, you can be resilient, but the water is still going to rise. And with that, I got my nugget, and that nugget was resilience. And I thought, I feel led to speak about resilience. How interesting and not coincidental that Ann talks of a missionary who was resilient and goes back again and again to preach the message of God and the message of salvation. How resilient was he in that? How Chris stands here and talks about the path that we're on and all the external things that are, are compounding daily in our lives, in our, in our church even, in our district. Like It's a lot, and we have to stand resilient. I have chills. Just the way that God has orchestrated all that prior to me saying a word this morning is not coincidence. That's, that's him. So our scripture this morning is 1 Peter 1, 1 through 9, and then 13 through 23. Not to omit the, the, the um, relevance of what's in between, but I just thought that was the most um, relevant. So it's 1 Peter 1, verses 1 through 9, and 13 through 23. Give me just a second. I just want that. Verses 3. Start with verse 3. First Peter 1, verse 3. Praise to God for a living hope. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy for you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And then if you jump to verse 13 through 23, be holy. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who has called you is holy... So be holy in all you do, for it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. Since you call on the Father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life, handed down to you from your forefathers. 
but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believed in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. I could probably just stop there. There's a lot of meat in that scripture. Um, so in speaking about resilience, what then does resilience mean? And of course, like Donnie, I um, consulted Webster. And resilience is many things, but basically it is defined as, and I have a couple different interpretations here, it's the capability of a strained body to recover its size and shape after deformity caused by a compressive, compressive stress. For some reason, that reminds me of memory foam. If you think of you sit in a chair of memory foam, you get back up and the chair rises, unless it's really old and then it's just time for new memory foam. But resilience, I think of memory foam. Um, also, an ability to recover from or adjust to misfortune or change or difficult conditions. We can probably all relate to that. Something that is resilient is strong and not easily swayed. And then, of course, there's spiritual resilience, which is the most important, and it's defined as such. The ability to maintain a positive spirit, even in the face of adversity. Seeking strength through, the definition said a higher power, and I would like to say one higher power, the Lord Jesus Christ that we know, just so there's no misinterpretation in that. So based on these definitions, who do you think of when I mention resilience? Maybe it's you. We'll never know if you're a humble servant. You'll probably never tell us, but you know how resilient you all are. Some of us know how resilient you all are. I think of a few examples. First and foremost, I think of my cousin, Paul Wilson. Paul Wilson, last year at the age of, I think, 50-something, I think he's older than me, he completed the Ironman contest. And... Paul is a man, and I invite you to look up his testimony. Paul is a man who pastors a church, church in Texas, and he didn't start even the physical training until just a few short years ago for this Ironman competition. Not only did he finish the competition, but he finished it with dignity. He's faced a lot of adversity, and he is now using his completion of the Ironman competition to witness to other people. And Paul will tell you, He's a pastor of a church, and some will listen. But he said now that title behind his name is also Iron Man, so more people, unfortunately it takes that, but more people now will listen. And so he's still using that platform to reach people for Christ. He's a very humble servant. He has what we need to stay resilient. He has the mental capacity for it, the physical endurance, and the spiritual component being the most important. Think of someone you know that suffered from a serious medical condition. That could happen in one of two ways. Could be a sudden or unexpected accident or injury. Could be something long-suffering, a long-suffering condition, such as cancer. On a lighter note, and another way that I see resilience is, of course, in my grandbabies. They get up, they fall down, they get back up again, they fall down, they get up, they fall down, they cry, they get up, they fall down, you get the picture. Resilient little ones they are at such a tender age. I also think about the ability, resilience can also be found not just in us, but in physical things, like the memory foam we talked about, but also I think of the stems of my glasses that still even rest on my head after the repeated squeezes from those grandbabies. Again, resilience, but in something not of human nature. The author David Hughes, I used his um, writings loosely to define seven components of resilience or identify seven components of resilience. The first being your competence. Where I stand firm and know what parts of myself to hold an open hand ready to be surprised by God is what he says. So in other words, you're competent enough. This is not an arrogance, but it's a spiritual knowing that you can reach out and God will help you fulfill fulfill the need or fulfill the calling that you've been called to do. 
The second being your confidence. This is not, again, an arrogance, but it's knowing what we believe. That song that we sing, I think it's called something like, We Believe and We Know, You Are the Way, the Truth, the Life, You Are the Lord. We sing that with confidence because we believe that with our whole being. We know that anything we can think about, ask for, or imagine, our God can handle, our God can do. He said it, we believe it, so be it, it's done. Just as Chris stands here and tells us, which we know to be true, the message that he gave to us, two genders. We know that. We stand firm on that because that's what's in God's word. Nothing more to be said. Thirdly, your character, what you're made of. There's no better self-assessment, Hughes says, than spending time in God's word. How often we spend time in the word, we're convicted, or once in a while we get a pat on the back. But more often for me, it's that conviction that says, I could do better in that area, surely, and thankful for the word that leads me to that. 1 Peter 1.8 talks about us being filled with glorious joy, as we read, receiving the gold of our faith and the salvation of your soul. Another one of the documentaries that I um, <clears throat> had to listen to on the way back home yesterday was talking about the characteristics of precious metals. We know of gold to be one of many precious metals, or one of a few precious metals, and I thought it was interesting how the characteristics of gold parallel our Christian walk. There were a couple things they mentioned, things like, and all of you probably know these things, but gold has a higher melting point than other metals. It's softer in texture. It's more lustrous, lustrous, I can't say that word, in appearance. It looks beautiful. It's less reactive than other elements. I don't know what they are. And it's very durable. It resists being tarnished or corroding. Often, we as Christians can be that way as well when faced with these adverse conditions around us. Number five, how you cope. I need to work on this one. Know that God has a plan and purpose for your situation, your life, and allow him to speak life and hope to you. Galatians 6, 9, we all know, let us not grow weary in doing good, reaping the harvest. Don't give up, basically. Number six, control. Control of your own life can only be sought or recognized if you've given up to the one true one who has control of your life. Realize who's really in control, the one who created you. A dear friend, Keisha Smith, recently put on social media, I'm thankful for social media that I can stay connected with Keisha. She's a dear friend that moved from our area. She shares this. When something doesn't work out as you wanted, believe that something better may be in store for you. Of course, when we're in the trial, it's hard to imagine that. Sometimes redirection is that godly intervention that led you from problems that you alone couldn't have predicted. Your attempts to impose control over a situation may lead you down a path that wasn't intended for you to travel. Bear with me here. And the final component, <clears throat> number seven, being the most important component of resilience is contribution, according to Hughes. In his book, How the Christian Life Nurtures Resilience, he says, the goal of resilience is not to achieve power and wealth, like Joseph, for example, although this could happen. The goal is to remain faithful to God so that you can bless others. Our contribution can be in giving and serving, taking our eyes off of ourself and then putting that towards others. 2 Corinthians 1.4 says, He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can then comfort others. I think of resilience in... Um, an example of something I saw over the weekend, not in, well, in Trinity's volleyball team, but more so even in the men's basketball team for Mountain View Christian School. And I purposefully say men because of the way these young men conducted themselves on and off the court all weekend long. Rarely, I must say, we've been sheltered from adversity when we're at these tournaments for these Christian schools. We just are. Everyone gets along. Everyone supports the referees. It's just a beautiful, almost bubble-like atmosphere where we're protected. However, I noticed during a specific game on Friday, Saturday, Friday, on Friday, our young men were playing against another group of boys, and Everything was going well. Picture yourself at this game. You're in the fourth quarter of a basketball game. There's three to four minutes remaining. 
Our team was ahead by a few points. I think it was six. At that point, both teams were winning, in my mind, in all ways. I still had a favorite team, of course, but what I saw on that court was outstanding sportsmanship, great defense, the refs and line judges serving with integrity. Then a timeout was called by the opposing team, and everything changed in that however long those timeouts last. We remained ahead, and we won that game in the last few minutes, but that's not the point of this story. What I saw in the last few minutes of that game were multiple intentional hurtful fouls from the opposing team. I saw an aggression that exemplified not the desire to win a game, but to win a game at any cost. No respect for fellow man. Mountain View not only won that game, but they were resilient in the face of that adversity. I watched one of our young men pick up an opponent when the ball was in our possession. He delayed the progress of our team to help his fellow man up who had tried to cause him to stumble. That's resilience, true resilience in the face of adversity. Those men stayed true to their character and earned that win with respect. So then, if resilience is the biblical norm for Christians, what, was, what must we do in the face of adversity? How do we contribute? There are four things, and then we'll close. First, we must trust God. Attempts on our own will fail. Sometimes we can succeed, but the, you know what I'm talking about. You've been there. Our own strength is so small compared to his supernatural capabilities. Second, pray fervently and deeply wisdom, with wisdom and strength, Romans 8.26. Number three, pray boldly and approach him with confidence. He understands. He already knows the situation. Receive his mercy and find grace. Four, there's actually five, I said four. Four, dig deeply into God's word. Another program we watched was about digging for gold. And what I learned in that program was that you can't always get to the gold unless you get through some big boulders that are keeping you from that gold. So when we dig deep into God's word, we want the gold, we want the milk, not just what's skimming the surface. And lastly, praise and worship even in the midst of adversity. Not only then, but especially then. That's it. Thank you. Chris has asked me to close. Let me see how we do that. We sing? <laughs> Our closing hymn is number 429.
those prayers are completely over. Dear Heavenly Father, we feel your presence here, Lord. I'm thankful for you today and every day. We're just thankful, thankful for this congregation. Thank you that the building still stands, Lord. We know that we are the church, but we appreciate being able to come here and worship you this morning, every Sunday morning, Lord. And we pray for those who can't be with us. May you uplift them and remind them that they are loved, Lord Jesus, with a love that you give and a love that we share with them. Just ask that you help us to go out this week and not just this week, Lord, but until you return, help us to be resilient, Lord. Help us see you and show you in all that we say and do. Help us to remain steadfast in your word. And we ask this in your precious name. Thank you, Lord Jesus.